I'm Marie Denoya Aronson at Rutgers University's Eagleton Institute of Politics, here today to continue the Center on the American Governor's profile of former New Jersey Governor Christy Todd Whitman and her administration. I'm joined today by Harriet Derman. Harriet Derman played several roles in the administration. She was Commissioner of Community Affairs, Chief Counsel, Chief of Staff, and then appointed to the Superior Court. We begin now with Harriet Derman. Okay, Harriet, let's begin with you. Tell us about you. Where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? A little bit about your background. I went, I grew up in Jersey City and I went to Syracuse University and then I transferred to New York University. I had met my husband and we got married and that's what women did then. They didn't wait to graduate. I got married while I was, I think, a junior, but I accelerated. So. Obtaining an MRS degree was a very important goal at that time, so I got married and I taught for a little while and then I had my first child and had three children and I'm still married to the same wonderful man and uh, he's a physician, so it was a good be auspicious beginning. Excellent, yes. Um, so I went on, and then I went to law school. Law school, I yes. Law I went to law school after I had children and it was sort of the beginning of the post Betty Friedan movement, I suppose, where women were responding to the feminine mystique. But I had always had a role model. My mother was an attorney, which was very unusual. She was admitted to the bar in New Jersey, I think, in the late 20s, early wow. 30s, when she became a municipal court judge in Jersey City in 1951 as a substitute during the summer. It was newspaper worthy. It made the newspapers. And so bear in mind, she was only a municipal court judge for two weeks, and it was a newspaper story. The headline, Mama is a Judge. And there is a picture, I still have it. I had in my chambers of you know, my mother donning a robe and my father helping her. So I always knew I was going to go to law school, so I did when my children were, I think, 10, 8, and 3. And then I went to Seton Hall Law School, and then I went on. I wasn't finished, and I obtained a master's degree in tax law from NYU. <laughs> How did you balance all that with the well, children so young? And good support from my husband. He was very supportive of all the changes. He let me grow, I think, and um, he came along. It's added a wonderful dimension to our lives. And my mother was there to help, and I had very good help in the house, too. What was your first interest in politics? What drew you in? Well, I was a very informed voter and frankly sort of stumbled into politics. I think I did work for a few years on, on Common Cause, but it really wasn't a calling for me. But my husband and I were very informed voters, and um, we were voting Republican. We lived in a Democratic county. Everybody we knew was a Democrat, and, but uh, we were voting Republican, and I frankly, candidly decided I wanted to become a judge. You can be the most capable lawyer in New Jersey, but if you don't know anyone, you're not going to become a judge, or lightning very seldom strikes. So I decided I would become active in the Republican Party. And uh, the chairman, Sam Thompson, asked me to run for the assembly. And I remember saying to him, Sam, I don't want to you know, run for the assembly, I want to be a judge. And he said, this will help Harriet. And so he put together a very interesting ticket, two men I didn't know, Jack Sinagra, he was the very popular mayor of East Brunswick, and Jeff Warsh, who was a young attorney. And we ran together, we remained very good friends. And we won, that was part of the anti-Florio, anti-tax Fuhrer 1991. And for the first time, as Sam Thompson told me, Republicans were winning local offices both in the municipality and the county level. I think the first time they had been a Republican clerk in 50 years or something like that. And so we did win. It was very exciting. I found it very difficult, very stressful. I took it very seriously and worked very, very hard. The campaign itself. The campaign, raising money. And I did a lot of door-to-door -door and standing at supermarkets. And um, frankly, I worked harder than the men did physically, I think. And I had some good people, handlers. My personal friends would call them my handlers or telling you what to do. But I had some very good people. And so we won. It was very exciting. And then 
Well, especially you're, you're in Middlesex County, right? Yes. Which is predominantly Democrat. And yes. As you mentioned, right. this was during the whole right. uh, anti-Florio backlash. Right. I was but. president of the Bar Association, the County Bar Association at that time, so it was a very, very busy time. In a sense, Sam Thompson didn't know whom he had asked to run. I was an unknown person to him, but I really came with some good support system. People who had never contributed to Republicans started writing checks and would write me notes and it's like, I'm a Democrat, I can't believe I'm contributing to the Republicans. Take my name off any general mailing list. Wow. Was the thought, the, were the predictions that you would not prevail in that election? I think the, you know, our surveys, everything showed the polls that we were doing well. We yeah. were doing well, and we did. We won, I think, by big margins, I don't remember that. We raised a lot of money. Jack was able to raise money, Jeff, and uh, we did well, and we had a great synergy together. We worked very, very well together. It was very, very unusual how well we all got along. Sonagra, German, Warsh. Huh. What did you think about serving in the assembly? Frankly, I was very informed, as I said, but more on a national level. Even though I grew up in New Jersey, I wasn't actually that informed about how New Jersey legislature won. But I learned quickly. <laughs> I learned quickly, and I went on this Assembly Judiciary Committee. It was very interesting for me as a lawyer. And um, I remember there was the, I think, I think it was the Rizzo kidnapping case, and there was something about evidence, and the, the wife couldn't testify because of uh, marital privilege. Oh, the... And she wanted to testify, I think. I'm sorry, are we talking about the Exxon executive? Yes, I yes. remember that case. And I remember thinking, wait, I can introduce a law about that and change that, and it wouldn't be ex post facto, we learned. So, so it was very exciting to be able to affect change. What an important way you did, it sounds <laughs> right, like, on that right. particular case. And I, I think we were very attuned to a lot of issues in New Jersey, and we had a very led, uh, successful, I think, legislative office, good constituent services, and we got into issues that were very important, campaign financing, and um, I sponsored myself Holocaust education that became law that mandated Holocaust education in New Jersey, and it was a very exciting time, it really was. It was a good time to be a legislative Republican in New Jersey. Well, right? it was yeah. because we were in the majority right. in both houses, so I think we were able to override Governor Florio's veto of the repeal of the sales tax. And, you know, it was very heady because, you know, when you're a Republican now and you're in the minority, it can be very frustrating. So it was, it was very exciting. It was. And I met a lot of very interesting people, and some of them are still my good friends. You were reelected in 1993. Yes. What persuaded you to give up this seat in the legislature to join the Whitman administration in 1994? Well, interestingly, in 1993, just before the election, or maybe in the middle of the year, an overture was made to me that I could get my judgeship if I wanted. I guess the Democrats wanted to get rid of me. And I thought, oh, I was very, very excited about the candidacy of a woman and of Christy Todd Whitman. Very excited. And I thought, you know, I, I'm just going to go with this. I want to see what this is like. I want to participate in her campaign. Not that I had any expectations of being her, in her administration, but I, I just found it so vibrant and exciting. And by coincidence, our local people were very close with her campaign. We had a very strong liaison, and I think we had a very strong presence in Middlesex County for Christy Whitman because of that an unusual relationship between our legislative office and her campaign. Of course, we kept everything separate. I should say our re-elect campaign and Governor Whitman's election campaign. It was very exciting. But again, we didn't have that strong candidates running against us. And Jackson Agra said, you know, if they ever put strong candidates against us, we might not win because this is a Democratic district. And eventually that anti-Florio syndrome is going to erode, which did happen. And again, I took it very seriously and I was very, very stressed. I thought, I cannot do this again. You know, retrospectively, I was too stressed out about it. It's just an election. It's not about family or health or anything. But um, so I, I said to myself, I cannot do this again. Either I'll be, you know, maybe I can get to be a judge now and not run again in 96. In the assembly, you have to run every two years, right? right. right. My good friend Jackson Agra only had to run, you know, I think it's four, four, and two. Right, right. So the first thing that drew you to Governor Whitman's campaign and Governor Whitman's administration was your interest in, wow, it's a woman. Yes. 
were there things that she said or issues that she stood for in particular that you happen to recall that really just resonated with you at that point? Well, of course, she was you know, fiscal conservative, which I was. And at that time, we used a word a lot, socially moderate. Those issues were important to me. And I can remember Jack Sinagra saying, you know, we're liberal. I said, Jack, don't use the word liberal. We're moderate. And so, you know, she was pro-choice. I was pro-choice. And uh, she was good on diversity issues and gay rights and issues that I believed in. So I was very comfortable with, you know, where she was going from a, a mission point of view. And also, I had the opportunity to see firsthand, see her campaign, and she really earned my respect. I mean, some of the things she had to do and eat kielbasa, you know, in South <laughs> River. That was a town, not district, you know, after having been at tailgating and campaigning at Giant Stadium. She really earned my respect. She worked hard. And I remember the Women for Whitman and Vet. It was very, very exciting. So working on the campaign for the first woman candidate, um, did you feel a lot of the you know, sort of um, prejudice, anti-feminist prejudice around her or... Um, you know, That's... I didn't. Sometimes I think maybe I was naive. I hear stories. I'm sure there was sentiments. I'm sure there were epithets. I'm sure there were comments. But for the most part, I didn't. I, a lot of people told me, men, that they thought it would be exciting to have a woman as governor, that women know how to make deals and uh, come to consensus and lead. So, you know, if it did exist, it's not strong enough to be in my memory. When did she ask you to be the Commissioner of Community Affairs? I think in, while she was in transition, I think I must have gotten a call in January be, because she did ask me just before the inaugural. I remember just after she asked me, she said she has to go work on her speech. And I had been interviewed, I think, oh yes, I, was, I got a call to meet with, now it's coming back to me, John Sheridan and Hazel for a position. I'm sure this was early January. I didn't know for which position. And frankly, I thought maybe commerce because I have a tax background. I represented business lawyers and business, I did business law, that kind of thing. And um, you know, Governor Whitman herself had me come down to the transition, transition office and she said, I remember my, she said, Commissioner of Department of Community Affairs. And I said, right, Commissioner of Department of Community Affairs, whatever that is, whatever they <laughs> do, she does or he does, yes. And I was very excited by the opportunity to now move to the executive branch of government. It was a very, I think, very exciting time. And as you began to discover your role, tell me about that process. I guess it, as you right. um, just said, it was sort of, okay, whatever that is, I'll do it. Um, right. What was your expectation that it would involve I, and what did it involve? Well, I found out later that it, what it really owned was all of the great society units that were created, whether it was in housing or uh, municipal aid, whatever, aid for women, aging, all, you know, where there were grants to get from the federal government, this is where it would go, to the Department of Community Affairs. So it was a little disparate. There wasn't that, there was not total homogeneity with all of the different units, but we made it work, a thousand employees, Big budget, I forget the number One now. billion dollars I have One in billion, my notes. One billion, right. <laughs> That's... Because people would confuse me with the director of the Division of Consumer Affairs, and I would say, no, I'm the Commissioner of Community Affairs, and I have a billion dollars to spend, and whatever. And, and some of my legislative people came to work for me, people I had depended upon, and they were very good right hands, because it was an overwhelming experience to come into this department. But I found some of the employees, the state employees who had been there a long time, were very knowledgeable, very capable people, and I could depend upon them. Because immediately we had to fill out something about federal aid, and it was like, what is this? Right, Where? Right. But somebody had the answers. And Governor Whitman was wonderful that way in terms of letting me hire good people, and of course people who were Republican, yes. But they had to be capable, and she was very, very good, and I think this was very unusual, about retaining people from the prior administration, even Democrats. And we did that if they were very good, at least for maybe 18 months. I'm thinking particularly of the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency. Chris Folio stayed. 
She was very good. People spoke highly of her, and we worked together. And at that time also, we, we were talking about smaller, smarter government, and she cooperated, other people. I mean, they had to get the joke that there was accountability, fiscal accountability. But it took a while for me to understand what I did. I remember right after I became commissioner, the Durham Woods explosion took place. And I remember my husband and I walking around our town of Metuchen at night, passing the fire station, and they were getting activated. And I said to my husband, I think I'm in charge of fire safety, too. But, you know, I soon Goodness. learned I was. Really, you know, not so much active firefighters, but fire safety, fire prevention. So, and I had the division of women and aging, which during the Whitman administration, to have smaller, smarter government move to the Department of Health. It became Health and Senior Services. That's right. I recall that. Um, who were some of your other key staffers? And Well, Debbie involved? DeSantis was my right-hand person, and she was deputy commissioner. She had been our campaign manager, and then she had been, I guess, I forget what the title was when she ran our legislative office. And the wonderful Beth Gates, who ran local government services. She had been I don't know, maybe her title was like the budget officer for the Republican Assembly, and she could just list numbers, you know, you could rattle them off to her and she'd remember them. It was unbelievable, and I was very, very fortunate to have her. Chuck Richmond was um, there before, and he was a stalwart, you know, he stayed and he was very helpful. And I also brought with me Bob Fryant, a wonderful man with whom I'm still friendly. And I guess he did press, but he was so much more than press. I think I'm really diminishing his role by saying press. I forget what his title was. But, I mean, he wrote my speeches. He had um, plans. We were able to have a housing plan. He was so involved in that. He just had his finger on the pulse of the state, very politically attuned and very savvy, just smart. And he was extraordinarily helpful to me, still close to him. How did it feel to be in a position to be this commissioner and to be able to take, you know, offer these kinds of appointments to people in your life? Well, it's heady. It was exciting, but I got a lot of support from Christy Whitman that I could have good people, that it really wasn't about political payback, that I could have good people. I had Alicia Diaz, who ran a Hispanic unit we had, and she was just fabulous. The people she would ask her questions. She'd come and and to work at like the housing events we had. And I can remember somebody asking her a question for five minutes in Spanish, and I'm thinking, she's not taking a note. How is she going to retain that and translate it? And she did, and her answer was substantive and accurate. So I had wonderful, I can't think of, oh, I can't think of the woman's name in aging, Ruth. I can't think of her name. I'm doing her mm -hmm. such a disservice. She was just wonderful, wonderful woman, really. And I think she knew Christy Whitman. Chris, Christy asked me to hire her, and I did, and she was wonderful. And then, but then she moved to um, health, when it became health and senior services. And there were people in local government services that worked under Beth Gates who were there before, thereafter, and they were wonderful people like Mark. Pfeiffer, I think, and I wish I'd had an opportunity uh -huh. to refresh my memory because I'm doing a disservice. There were a lot of wonderful people, and um, it was a great opportunity. But I, I was, I guess, as the nature of my personality, I was stressed out. My husband uh -huh. described me then as tense and intense, my only two states of mind. So <sighs> I felt very responsible for the thousand people that worked for me. I don't know if you want me to tell you vignettes or... Absolutely, and all those so, units. I mean, there's, you know, all those, like, just right. areas that are so important I remember to I, I ran into an employee, the head of human resources, and there was a story about one of our employees was caught having sex during lunch, and he's telling me about it, and I'm thinking, well, I know I have a lot of different units, but I said to him, but, you know, really, why do I care? Am I like the sex police? And he said, but commissioner, it was in a DCA car. So that was it. When I left, I remember thinking I should have enjoyed this more. I should have relaxed. I, I was one of those people. I had to read everything, all the letters that went out, all the press releases. And we wanted a housing policy, and we did. I forget how many units, but we announced that we were going to build so many units. And we went pretty far to do it. Oh, at HMFA, we had... Wonderful Tracy Battis and Eileen Hawes. Some of these people were just fabulous that uh, worked for these agencies. 
Tell me about the housing. Would you list that as one of your main accomplishments? I think so. I think so. We really were able to um, put a lot of units up. We spent a lot of time on housing. And one of the big things that we did at HMFA is, people do not appreciate that, but the federal government offers something called tax credits. They, For whomever gets them, they are extraordinarily lucrative. I am talking millions of dollars of credits on your tax return. You just subtract money you owe. So people want them. And when I came in, I asked Chris Florio how it was determined who was going to get them. And she said, you don't want to know. I could be more specific, but I better not put on tape. She said, you don't want to know how it's done in prior administrations. So I said, well, we have to have a plan. And we did. We came up with a plan. So we gave points. We had a point system. I think multifamily in urban areas got more points than senior citizen in suburban areas. And that's how we dispensed them. It became competitive. And my understanding is they keep those rules and regulations to this day. And to Christy Whitman's credit, she wanted that. She was very into good government, into, yes, we are politicians, yes, we have friends, but let's do it in a way that is rational. And we, we take care of people, but only people who are worth taking care of, who are informed and knowledgeable and smart and professional and not going to get us in trouble, do the wrong thing. We were very, very concerned about good government. And I think to this day, Christy Whitman doesn't get credit for that. Just backtracking a bit, just to mm -hmm. clarify, of course, when you're talking about housing units, you're talking about low income. Low income housing, because New Jersey has Mount Laurel is one of the reasons right. where communities have to have a fair housing obligation. Oh, that was another wonderful woman I had, Shirley Bishop. How could I forget Shirley? She became head of the Council on Affordable Housing. Oh. And so committed to housing was Christy Whitman that we had legislation introduced, John Farmer, I think, spearheaded it for us, that the commission of the Department of Community Affairs would become, I think, chairperson or at least a member of COA. Subsequent governors have, you know, moved away from COA. It's become, you know, an anathema affordable housing and requiring municipalities to build affordable housing and so forth. But Christy Whitman embraced it as a good government thing. And again, something she really didn't get credit for. And we worked also in local government services. Again, fiscal accountability was very important. We worked with the treasurer's office with Brian Clymer, and we would audit municipalities. Beth Gates, I think, was in charge of that. And we would see where the money was not being well spent or wasted. I can remember going to a League of Municipality event, and the mayor of an Essex County city was entertaining local politicians and legislators and serving like shrimp and lobster. And I'm thinking, you know, the taxpayers in New Jersey are paying for that. I don't think that's such a good idea. So we had, did a lot of work in Camden. Camden was a desperate city. I remember at one time we took over the parking authority. Beth Gates became the director of the Camden Parking Authority because it was just a wasteland of corruption. So um, again, I don't think Christie got credit for all of these things. Um, well, uh, the division on, on uh, women Oh, Linda Broker ran the division okay. on women. <laughs> and what were some of the accomplishments you, you oh, were able to put together you know, there? I, I, I think with regard to um, domestic violence, that was a big issue. I, I, trying to think of what some of their other issues were, mostly domestic violence and health issues. And, you know, of course, although Christy was pro-choice, we, we didn't really, I, I don't recall that we did anything through the division on women with respect to that issue. And just focusing on women, that women can do, participate, that we're out there. And also with housing, we would coordinate that with housing. And we would dedicate units for women who had left a bad situation, a domestic violence situation, and needed you know, emergent housing. So we had shelters for women. And again, we could coordinate through the housing with the um, division on women. That sounds like a major development right, to, serve, right. to serve people. So I think that really. was, again, something Christy didn't get credit for, with that fact that a mission for her commissioners was coordinating all of your different units, and not only within the department, but with other commissioners. Work together. Don't be competitive. I had to give up the division of aging, senior citizens. 
you know, historically, commissioners don't want to give up employees or budget dollars, but I felt that was part of my responsibility to be gracious about it, to show Governor Whitman where the savings would be. I think there came a time when we had a meeting with her and Len Fishman, the commissioner, and we were like making a presentation of where it should go, and she said, that's where it should go, and as far as I was concerned, that's where it went. And I tried to send that message to all my employees who didn't want to move, that they had to cooperate. Fire safety was a little bit of a challenge. The firefighters, they're all about, and fire safety, they're all about the guy with the biggest toy or truck, fire truck wins. So they're, they're a little bit um, territorial about their areas, but we like to think we won them over. So if you were to, there, you encountered resistance on, I guess, different fronts because you were dealing with so many different areas. Well, I'm sure areas. probably in fire safety, they weren't that happy about having a woman as commissioner and taking, you know, orders or lead. But if they were, if they, it was out there, I never heard it. I also like to think that I was well qualified and I had a very strong and deep resume. And if they want to take me on with issues, we want to start talking to me about substance, we'll talk. So, you know. Do you recall any specific initiatives that you brought to, to that uh, unit, to the Division of Fire Safety? I think it was more about um, streamlining. I can't really remember right. that there was a lot of redundancy. And also, that was there, I think they have been fire inspectors in each municipality that they had to be competent also. And there was a lot of, I think, notoriety and some of the characters were um, less than professional. I think we read them in the Riot Act in different municipalities. Same thing I, I, I didn't ma mention, which is very important. Codes and standards, another unit, very important, right. building codes and standards, run by the wonderful, wonderful Bill Conley, who had been there for a long, long time, and very important. They set all the codes and standards for New Jersey, and apparently New Jersey really set the standard for the country, too. And, you know, sometimes I had to close down theaters if Bill Conley told me they weren't safe. I'd get a call from a legislator. He heard that his town was having a big event and I had just closed the theater down. This really happened. And I remember saying to that state senator, well, do you want to read in the Star Ledger that 500 children died in that theater? Bill Conley tells me it's a problem. He'd say, okay. And there was a lot of issues with the casinos, too, because he would have rules about smoking and lights and things like that. And, but if Bill Conley told me something, I knew that I could depend upon him. He was, he was a wonderful man, wonderful long-term state employee. Really important right, for, right. for someone in your position. How long did you serve in that position? I think I served in that position from January 1994 till April 1996. Wow. And then, uh, did your service in the assembly help you, you think, as commissioner? Oh, very definitely, because I knew all the legislators and they trusted me. I didn't mention that you get to distribute a lot of municipal aid. And, and I remember I met the senator from Trenton the first day when I'm going to be commissioner, and he mentioned some acronym for aid. And I just made believe I knew what it was. <laughs> and I said to my person afterwards, do you know what that is, MRP or something like this? She said, I don't know what it is, but we figure it's money. He wants it. That's it. So, but my report, yes, because the legislators considered me one of them. And also getting back to Governor Whitman, there was aid to distribute, and with Beth Gates, Again, we tried to do the right thing. Did we try and help the people who were with us? Uh, absolutely. But we really struggled to do the right things. We had a lot of urban areas that needed help. They needed accountability. They needed to understand that accountability was important. And uh, Christy, Governor Whitman, was very, very supportive of that. So but getting back to the legislators, yes, they were my friends. So it helped. And you were able to draw from that experience to staff up for your position once you right, had that right. appointment. Yeah, that sounds key. I still got nervous because that's the way I was when I appeared before appropriations to justify my budget. Because as I said, I tense and intense. What does that feel like? I've covered you know, it so many you never times. Know, <laughs> you know, you, know, you want to prepare. I prepared. I spent a lot of hours. And, and probably I didn't have to know the nitty gritty, the numbers and everything. That's why I think you have support all around you to help yes. you. But... I tried to know it myself, you know, and um, 
that's just standards I set for myself. And you don't want to embarrass the governor. I didn't want to embarrass the governor. So you don't know what they're going to ask you. Sometimes the question's off the wall. But you know, sometimes you can predict. So I prepared. Wow. Well, from this position, the appointment to be chief counsel, tell right. me about how that occurred and what that meant to you when you were asked. You know, I think I was just starting to get relaxed as commissioner, mm -hmm. and she asked me to be chief counsel, and um, it was hard. We were going right in April into an ugly budget. The budget has to be done by June 30th. There were a lot of issues on my desk, and um, so it was hard. I, but that position only lasted three months. I'll, I'll tell you about that, I'm sure. But I was just starting to get comfortable in that position. And then I, had a, I was asked to move to chief of staff because of a big change. But I was just getting, I think, comfortable. It took me three months as chief counsel. And uh, it was very exciting. And I can remember seeing a picture in the Law Journal with a picture of me in the Law Journal as chief counsel to the governor. I found it very exciting, very heady. I did, you know, and I said my mother was a lawyer. I wish she had lived to see that, yeah. that her daughter was chief counsel to the governor and in the New Jersey Law Journal. So surely a, a very big step, that's right. very gratifying, but did you find at all, um, feel any regrets about leaving as uh, the commissioner, well, I, considering all right. that Right, I think only that I didn't relax enough, that I wish I could do it over again and be a little bit more relaxed. I just had taken myself too seriously, put in too many hours early in the morning, late at night, I didn't have to read every letter. I probably didn't have to go to as many events as I did. I didn't have to meet with almost anybody who wanted to meet with me. My door was open. My conference room was very busy. Oh, I think I ruptured my Achilles tendon just before in 94, I guess, early, I guess, in the administration. You know, I hobbled around for 12 weeks on crutches, but I still... Um, managed to meet with everybody who wanted to meet with me and go to events. I have a lot of pictures at housing events. I'm on crutches. So, so I think Governor Whitman signed my cast, something like, I, I saved it. I might have it. This is no time for you know, taking time off or for the easy road just because you're in a cast. So whatever. I took wow. that seriously. She didn't have to tell me anyway. Sounds like that, yes. How did you find, well, all these positions, the juggling with uh, your role in the family, your kids. Well, at, at this time, it, it, it worked because um, my three children were really somewhat emancipated. I became active in the Republican Party when my last child went to college in 1990, and he graduated from college in 1994. So I remember going to his college weekend and preparing for the Appropriations <sighs> Committee. It was going to follow that, I guess, in May of 94. They're very supportive. My family was very supportive. What were um, your major victories in your brief role as chief counsel? The budget, probably. Sure. I, you know, and I think there were union issues. I can't remember. I'm, I'm sorry. There was something about union funding. I used to call them ugly babies. If the legislature was like, didn't want to do something, but it was something Christy Whitman wanted to do, I would call it an ugly baby. That, you know, I had a few ugly babies dumped on my lap. But I remember there was something about public bidding, unions. It was hard. We got done working with the um, PBA. There was some issue they wanted. But mostly just getting the budget done for June 30th is a big enough for the chief counsel. Governor Whitman, I believe, was still implementing her income tax. So, you know, we were looking for revenue. So it was hard but we got it done. I had good people. I inherited good people in council's office. I didn't hire anybody, I think, for that. And I had good people who work with me. Um, well, I succeeded Margaret Foti, who was chief counsel, but John Farmer was there, and I knew him, and he was... We worked very well together. And I think Michael Torpy... I think Michael was the deputy, actually. Michael was the deputy. We worked together on that. So you, you say you were there for about three months, and then tell me about when <laughs> you were asked to move to chief of staff. Um, I can remember sitting at a meeting with Herb Tate, who was the president of the Board of Public Utilities, and I think everybody, I think it was well known that Chief Justice Willens was ill, but I remember, I think Marie, excuse me, Governor Whitman's secretary said, 
excuse me, that the Chief Justice was on the phone and wanted to speak to her. And so she went to take the call and she came back and like she abbreviated the meeting with Herb Tate and I had to go, I think, to the Senate president, and I ran into Debbie Poritz, who was the attorney general and was now going to be announced as um, chief justice. And I remember somehow somebody saying, does anybody know where Debbie is? And I, she's upstairs. It was that kind of thing. It was a, it's a blur, but I do remember that. And the governor, apparently, she had a backup plan because she announced it, I think, that day or the next day. Her plan, her chief of staff, Peter Venero, would become attorney general, and attorney general Poritz would become chief justice, and I, who had just been chief counsel for three minutes, would be chief of staff. So it was not any job I ever wanted, ever, ever, especially I knew she was facing an election in, I guess, um, a year and a half. So to be chief of staff while she's running for office, but I felt you don't say no. If the governor asks you to do something, you don't say, I don't think so, you know, or I'd rather stay. I, I think probably if I had my druthers, I would rather have stayed as chief counsel, definitely, and let somebody else do chief of staff. But, but you were I don't a good think soldier. You, no. you I said yes. Good, I was a good soldier. I was a good soldier. Right. What was that like? Tell, tell us it about it. It was very you. hard. How very long? Hard. I didn't Did, how long if, were you there? I was there from, um, so I think July of 96 to very early in February of 98 when I became a judge. Wow. But um, it was, a, you know, it was the campaign. It was, Christy Whitman was running, going to run for re-election. Plus, candidly, she was a very precious commodity. She was like a jewel. I felt somebody had given me a jewel to take care of because... Maybe she had national aspirations, or other people had national aspirations for her. And I felt I was given a treasure to take care of. It was a huge, huge responsibility. And here I've already described what a nervous, intense person I am. So to take on a burden like this, it was awesome. I, I don't think, frankly, I could have done it without my husband keeping me sane. What were some of the challenges and difficulties? Well, you know, dealing with the legislature and uh, getting her agenda through, personnel. She went on, uh, she was you know, very popular around the country. You know, she, so I have to take care of the store while she was out um, making friends around the country. And keeping on message, keeping all of her commissioners in line, that's what the chief of staff does. And uh, keeping other people with expectations, keeping them in line making sure there was nothing untoward that happened. I guess we went to the campaign in 96 in um, San Diego. I think Governor Whitman was the co-chairman with Governor Bush, who became, right. who became um, president. We shared a trailer with him. We stole yeah. his chocolate chip cookies when they weren't <laughs> looking. That, that must have been right. exciting to be it was part very of the exciting, national but It was very challenging, page. very challenging. So, what were your typical days like? Were they as long as when you were um, community affairs or longer? Longer, longer. Wow. I 24 7. 24 7. Just when I thought I couldn't work harder, I worked harder. I, yes, I was very hands on. Maybe I should have delegated more. I, I just didn't know how to do that. And I felt, again, this enormous responsibility for Governor Whitman. It seems to me that with all you learned at community affairs and then the brief. Chief Council, it all prepared, seems as if all it all it, led to all prepare you for all more and more. And, you know, and, and even uh, dealing with the legislators. Uh, I, Eileen McGinnis would say, you know, sometimes they act like children, and having been a mother is a good experience to get them to reach some sort of a consensus. But it was very hard all the time. Everybody wants a little bit of you. All those people with expectations from Governor Whitman come to you. They come to you if they can't be met. Every everybody, it's a lot of pressure. Um, a lot of pressure. Um, uh, were your pre predecessors helpful to you? The other, oh, the chiefs yes. of staff that that yes. came before. Yes, yes, they were. Helpful. In what way? And oh, you know, I could always call upon them to. Um, 
for assistance. I remember right after I became chief of staff, there was that terrible plane crash. I think it was an Air France plane in Rockaway. And I had to get Christy Whitman out there. And it's like, well, how do I get a governor out there? So she's treated like a governor with the other governors. I guess it was Governor Cuomo, though, so they recognize her. So that it's easy to forget get there. And I think I called Peter Venera, who was my predecessor, and he said, call the state police. And that's it. One call leads to another. You get the job done. Treated like a governor. That's interesting. Right. Tell, <laughs> tell me about what your concerns were around well, that. I, you know, I didn't want her to have to... Uh, wait in line, not be recognized, not be in the front row, not be asked to speak. You want her to have the respect and do that she's supposed to have. So start making calls. Even today, somebody will say, you know, if I organize something, they'll say, oh, how did you do that? And I say to myself, I was chief of staff. I, get, I know how to get things <laughs> done. Not that I always like it, and it's not that it's relaxing, but you do what you have to do. What were some of the major accomplishments of, of the administration at that time? I know she was involved in re-election campaign, but were, were there other I things? I think there was a big education piece with the NJEA. As a legislator, I had a very good relationship with the NJEA. I can't think of the woman's name now. Um, and I had a very good rapport. My, the, my legislative district worked closely with the NJEA, which I guess was unusual for Republicans. And... I continued that relationship, and I think we had a funding bill, and I remember that it wasn't going anywhere. It was at an impasse, and I stepped in and got it done. It was a very important. I wish I remembered more exactly the fiscal implications. I remember it was very important, and it was presented to me by my staff that they couldn't get it done, and frankly, I got it done because I called the person, the head of the NJEA, and I said... Let's talk. Let's you and I talk. Let's you and I talk. And we got it done. I found my, frankly, my staff sort of catatonic. They was like, we can't do this. We have to do this. What are we going to do? And I said, okay, get me so-and-so. I wish I remember her name. We had a very good rapport. And um, might be DD something I can't remember. D Corona. D Corona. D Corona. D Corona. She oh. trusted me. I trusted her. We worked together, and we got that done. It was very important, I remember. I wish I remembered more of the particulars. What do you think it was, the fact that you were willing to just, you know, step up and say, this is a conversation that needs to happen now? Is that... Is that I think something like that. And, uh, you know, also, I think it's... You have to know when people, when they've reached the end, what they're willing to give. I, I find I do mediation now. You have to listen very careful, carefully to what people are telling you for clues as to how far they're going. And you always have to leave them with self-respect. They have to feel like they won a little bit. Christy Whitman talked about that. When you know you have a compromise, a good compromise, when everybody's a little unhappy. And um, that's what happened with, with G. Corona. And I think I called upon that. And similarly, the NJEA, which is traditionally Democratic, I think because I worked with D, and I haven't thought about this in a long time, they were neutral in that 1997 election, which was a very big thing for them not to endorse a Democrat. They remain neutral in that campaign. Did Governor Whitman recognize your role in having that happen? Do you remember talking about that with her? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. At the time, I'm sure she appreciated it, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Interesting what you said about listening for clues when you're in negotiations right. like that. So that was your training as an attorney, as a Maybe, mom, right, as right, it all came right, to... Right, 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 And I also felt that, you know, literally, I remember working on... Uh, oh, she had... It wasn't our finest piece of legislation, but she had the pension bond issue, and we needed votes. And, you know, retrospectively, I wish I had been tougher and said, do not do that, Christy. Do not do that. Do not do that. Brian Clymer kept insisting... There were no other sources of revenue. Well, we see $15 billion later, multiple years of our budgets being so much higher. They found other money. They found one-shots. They found gimmicks. He was committed to that, and she was willing to do it. And I, I do regret I went along with it. I, I always regret it. I should have said to her, Governor, don't do that. Do not do that. She spent a, little, a lot of political capital getting it done. And it hurt her reputation, I think, and she shouldn't have done it. But, but to get it done, 
which was my mission. I had to get it done. I can remember getting on a knee to some silly state senator and more or less begging him. I mean, it sounds funny, but I was like, okay, what do you want? You know, what are we going to do to get this done? And getting the votes and getting it done because she wanted it done. Once she was out there, it had to get done. But you thought it was a bad idea. It's not that we thought it was a bad idea. It, was, it wasn't a good idea, okay? It wasn't a great idea. It was, aren't there alternatives, something else to do? To this day, I know state workers who blame Governor Whitman for hurting their pension plan, and I will say, excuse me? Could you please tell me what you're talking about? How, I think you're getting your pension now. Could you please tell me how it was diminished by Governor Whitman? Uh, 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 that kind of thing. So that's what's out there, and it's never really been dispelled. She doesn't get support in the press, even later, Star Ledger. And um, so you feel that criticism, that that policy began sort of a domino effect to the pension system is unfair. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Do, I don't think it was a good move for her, but I don't think it caused the budget problems that have been, to which it's been attributed since then. Yeah. And, and you think that it wasn't a good move because? Because there were other easier ways to find revenue. There were other less controversial ways to find revenue. But her treasurer said, no, this is it. This is the only way. So she did it. So a lot of a lot of political capital for something that you right. felt and there were she'd other. go to meetings all that year and have to talk about it. Right. Insurance also became a very difficult issue. Some woman from East Brunswick got a um, podium, a microphone on 101.5 about the cost of insurance in New Jersey and ran with that. So she had to do automobile insurance reform. That issue is nowhere now, and I think mm -hmm. she did. She did some tort reform in that regard, and she doesn't get credit for that. John Farmer worked on that. Hmm. Interesting. Well, overall, what would you say it was, it was like to work for and with Governor Whitman? Her strengths, her weaknesses? Well, again, it was very exciting. I, I did, it wasn't lost on me that I was working for a female governor. I, not that I'm this you know, broad-burning feminist, but it's important to me. I wish there were more women in government. And at that time, she was very popular. I traveled after that, and people would say, I love your governor, I love your governor. So it was a very, very exciting time. And uh, I, I, liked, I realized that I had a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And we worked on some interesting issues, whether it was education, finance reform, and uh, other issues. And um, we... We struggled, struggled, Christy struggled always to do the right thing, and I don't think she's gotten enough credit for that, to hire the right people, to keep the right people, to distribute money appropriately and rationally with a plan, and uh, I don't think Governor Whitman got credit for that. Circling back to the pension bond right, issue, right. what do you think should have been done to dispel that criticism, or maybe even should be done at this point? Well, I think Governor Whitman has to probably get out there more and talk about it and um, or write letters to the editor or, or some get her some of her friends. People knew how to do that when she was running for office, get people to write letters and op-ed pieces that meet with the um, editorial boards, that kind of thing. But Governor Whitman doesn't seem to want to do that. Several um, times during this interview you've mentioned you feel like the administration, the governor, didn't get the credit she deserved. Right. Um, how would you assess this administration, sort of now in retrospect as we talk about it as a whole? Well, I think she did a lot of good things, a lot of positive things. Um, I'm not an environmentalist, but I understand she was considered very good on the environment. She doesn't get credit for that. For being a fiscal conservative and having smaller, smarter government, she doesn't get credit for that. And uh, so, and for the lack of corruption, We've seen a lot of governor's offices who have been tainted by corruption. That didn't happen in the Whitman administration. I think there was one ancillary issue with um, I, I, the sports authority or something in the Sea Caucus area, you know, so attenuated from Governor Whitman or the Turnpike, I can't remember, one of the authorities, not the Turnpike, I can't remember what authority it was. And it was so attenuated from her, but, you know, 
she should get more credit for this, the fact that it was almost pristine, her administration. Pristine. What was, do you remember what your reaction was, um, I believe, after her re-election campaign, the whole Ed Rollins controversy that sparked? That was it, not her re-election. That That's was her, her election. election. I'm sorry, yes, her election. We had, what we, the challenge we had for her re-election was there was a third-party candidate, Mary Sabrin. Oh, yes. And later, I think, I've learned, she learned that he was perhaps funded by the Right to Life movement. You know, Governor Whitman was pro-choice and vetoed, I think, the partial birth abortion bill. And, and um, I, I always thought people blamed me for that because I was pro-choice. I had nothing to do with that. I think, I actually think Governor Whitman didn't see that coming. Nobody understood what partial birth abortion was, that uh, how smart Right to Lifers were, that it would have a resonance with people that it was such a horrible procedure. And so I think if Christy Whitman had had more time to think about it, she might have made a, taken a different position. I don't know, she was pro-choice after all, pro-women. But that sort of came from nowhere, I think, and took her by surprise. And I had nothing to do with it. She had already taken that position. And but so there were people in the far right who were very unhappy with her, people in her own party who were very, very unhappy with her. and. Some of them may have voted for Murray Sabrin, and that's why uh, it was a very challenging election. A very challenging election, and split took, drained, siphoned some Republican votes from her. It was very hard. Speaker Jack Collins take a position at that point? I, well, you know, Speaker Collins, I've heard through the grapevine that he was a little bit of a misogynist. Huh. I, I, you know, I don't know that he had said things about Christie, but they would not, I remember talking to the Senate president, um, Donald G. Francesca, who was ostensibly pro-choice. They insisted on putting that up for a vote. I remember we begged them not to put it up for a vote. John Farmer, Mike Torpy, we all used whatever influence we had with the legislature. Please do not put this up for a vote. Please do not make Governor Whitman have to veto it. And uh, they wouldn't listen. Why do you think that happened? Why do you think they were Well, so I don't know. I may, maybe there's one school of thought is they were trying to stick it to her. I don't know. Or in the other is they believed in it. Their, their um, members wanted it. I don't really know, but they, they didn't. What did you observe about her relationship with those legislative leaders? She didn't really have a great relationship with the legislative leaders or the members of the legislature. When I came in as chief of staff and chief counsel, you know the word was, they're bringing Dermot in because she has a great rapport with the legislators and so forth, but um, she didn't have such a great, I, and as a matter of fact, I came in, I think when I came in in July, I, I think uh, the speaker was feuding with Peter Venero, the chief of staff, they hung up on each other and it was like, wait, you want me to rectify this? I mean, it was a very, I came into a very difficult situation. Um, she was supposed to play golf with them. They didn't play golf, have them for dinner. They wouldn't come. It was there the was speaker a, and the Senate president. They, a, but, real, uh, a real, a real, right. almost hostility then. But on the other hand, I was present when we had this kickoff for this archives and Senate pre president, who I'm in fair disclosure is a friend of mine and I'm at his law office now. He feels that his members did everything that Christy Whitman wanted almost everything except probably the partial birth abortion. Whatever she wanted, they tried to do for her, even in terms of appointments that they didn't even want. Was it just a um, bad mix be of boys. personality? Was I, it because know, she was she's a woman? And what, what I, was I, it? You know, I don't know. Uh, Governor um, Governor Whitman had never been a legislator. Tom Kane was a legislator. Governor Florio was a legislator. Uh, all the things we love about Christy, by the same token, she's not going to hang out and have beers with these guys. So she wanted to be home and have dinner with John as much as she could. So she wasn't into hanging out with these guys and schmoozing with them. They talk about Barack Obama, who doesn't do that now. I suppose, I hadn't thought about it before, I suppose it's not too dissimilar. I mean, she had a good rapport. She always entertained their calls. She'd always have meetings with them if they wanted. But, you know, she wasn't going to go have a beer with them, that kind of thing. How do you think her um, sort of surprise inaugural uh, address when she jumped, when she did the, the retroactive tax cuts I think, resonated with them? 
where they were like, we're going to do what? But they <laughs> did it. They did it. And again, I guess uh, Senator, former Governor DeFrancesco would say, see, we did what she wanted. I don't know. But I'm I sure, look, I'm not going to be naive. I'm sure that there was a great deal of undercurrent hostility to a woman. These guys were used to being, you know, the head honcho, to being it to having token women in the legislature as, you know, minority whip or majority whip or whatever. But it was run by men. It's a male thing down there. It's a male dominated, dominated place. And women have made inroads, but it's still male dominated. So I think, and uh, we had a lot of women in the front office. Judy, Ch Judy Shaw was the first chief of staff. And so I'm sure there was a lot of unhappiness. Because you know, when it comes down to it, it's about relationships, right? It's about... It's, relationships are important. Relationships are important. Wow. Well, that must have been a challenge for you then, to be it, called in to sort of be the person to broker challenge. the peace, right. is what it you're was, saying. <laughs> right. It was very difficult. But we tried to keep them happy. We try, I think we were... I mean, I had good people. Phil Angarone and uh, Mike Torpy, John Farmer, again, trying to keep... And some of his lawyers, I wish I could remember their names... Just try Maggie Villain. I mean, we tried to keep these people happy. Maggie worked in the front office. Her father had been a legislator. Everybody knew him, so we tried to keep these people happy. What was your relationship like with Speaker Collins? I had a good relationship with him because uh, I was in the assembly. I think he was majority leader when I was elected to the assembly. Chuck Hightian had been the speaker. And again, Chuck also spoke how supportive they were of Christie. And I know from being a legislature in 1993, he said to our, I forget, senior caucus or whatever, when we would meet in his office, we are going to help Christie Whitman get elected. This is in 93. We are committing to Christie Whitman. Now, I don't know if Jack Collins felt that way down there in South Jersey, but Chuck put up. Chuck put up. So I, I had a good rapport with Jack Collins because I was one of his assembly people and uh, you know a comer as far as people were concerned yes. so he, he was fine I had a good rapport with him. Um, I asked you a few minutes ago about the Ed Rollins situation do you recall well, that? Well I wasn't and... really involved because I had just won my own assembly seat and this was about Essex County and so we were all taken back by it and, and you know it was just one of those very unfortunate things and distraction for Governor Whitman. Did it cause you to question her at never, all? Or her never, campaign? never, 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 never. And I mean, looking back now, seeing how, you know, chaste and virginal and goody goody we were, that's impossible that that ever happened. Impossible. Even the 97 campaign, we had certain notorious, salacious information. Governor Whitman wouldn't use it mm -hmm. against McGreevy. Governor. Whitman would not use it. She would not be party to that. Well, so Interesting. Um, when did Governor Whitman appoint you to the Superior Court? I think in February 1998. So, fine. finally. Finally. And now I can say. The means to the end, and here was the end. How what a feel? detour. What a detour. <laughs> so now I've been in three branches of government. I think I said at my swearing, and I could now uh, interpret my own legislative intent or something <laughs> and uh, judges aren't supposed to, you know not supposed to have too much freedom in that regard about um, interpreting statutes so it was very exciting that's what I wanted and I came full circle it was very very exciting going back to getting the call from Sam Thompson you know yes. and he asked me to run for the assembly it's like how did I this happen but you know I worked very very hard it's part of my nature, and I, I had wonderful support, wonderful support. And it's, uh, somebody just said to me recently, you've had a great run, and I said, yeah, I hadn't thought about it, but I guess you're right, I've had a great run. How, and once you're there, was it, every, was it worth everything that you went through to it get there? It was more exciting. Oh, to be a judge? Yes. Me? Oh, being a judge is wonderful, very one. But first of all, you know, it's intellectual, and I, I like that, it's challenging, and... Uh, you can do the right thing. And again, being a judge, one of the most important qualities of a good judge is listening. You have to really, really listen. You, you read a memo before, and then not too frequently. You usually have decided, because you, your law clerk will write up both sides. You've read both sides. But you listen, and you think, oh, I didn't think about that. So being a good listener is a good skill. That's terrific. So tell us about your 
career once you left the governor's office. I guess you are, in, in a sense, telling me that. But So I was on the bench, I think, from 1998 till 2009. I retired early. I didn't have to retire as uh, Governor Francesca said at my retirement dinner. He was afraid everybody would think I was 70. It's like, very thanks. I'm glad you told everybody how old I was in your first sentence. Um, but I just, being a judge is wonderful, and I miss it enormously. I miss the bench, but uh, I love to go to all the judicial meetings that I can and the judicial college, and I just joined the Retired Judges Association Board. There is such an organization. But I, I'm very fortunate to have eight grandchildren, among all my wonderful titles of Your Honor and Judge and Chief, and Commissioner Bubby is the best title. <laughs> and my husband and I wanted to travel. And so you get a lot of time off as a judge, but it's very constrained. You don't have any spontaneity. And I just thought, well, I'm young, and I hope I'll be healthy enough. I, I just want to retire from the bench. And so I joined Governor G. Francesca's firm. And uh, I do mediation, or I'm appointed by a judge, both federal and state, as a special master. And I do arbitration, excuse me. And also, I was asked to join the board of the New Jersey Law Journal. And I find that to be really exciting. The people are very, very smart. And um, we write, write editorials weekly and uh, extraordinarily stimulating. You know, you'll get an editorial, somebody will respond, and then somebody is quoting Cicero and the Bible and Lincoln and the Federalist Papers. It's like Shakespeare. How do they know this? Like, you know, it's very challenging and exciting. So things are good. Congratulations. Good for you. <laughs> Thank you. So any parting words for us about the Whitman administration and your experience? It was a wonderful opportunity. I met wonderful people, including Governor Whitman and uh, her family and all the people who served, some without acknowledgement. And some of the state workers who were there were wonderful people, extraordinary people, really cared about doing the right thing. And I got to, I, I got to go exciting places with Governor Whitman. I'm, my, I think my first week on the job, I was, um, we took a helicopter to meet Prime Minister Netanyahu, and it's like, I didn't know where I go. I remember saying to Jason Volk, who helped her, and I'd say, Jason, where, where I go. He says, you go in there, you go in there. So I was like, oh my God. And I don't remember who was there. If Senator Dole was there, I can't remember. I remember. It was very, very exciting. Very, uh, and you know, once I took a call on a Saturday night from Jesse Jackson. It was like, no matter, I may disagree with him on a lot of things, but I, you know, I render onto Caesar what is Caesar. It was Jesse Jackson on the phone. He wanted to speak to Governor Whitman. So all of those opportunities going, we traveled, we went to Israel together. There I, I didn't work 24-7, I worked 28-7. It yeah. was very, very hard in Israel, but very exciting. And then we went to France and we met Ambassador Harriman and it was, you know, cool stuff, really great stuff, but it, it was hard. There were a lot of, when we were in Israel, there was the whole issue about, I think, whether she was going to go to the one area which had just been op opened and it was controversial to the Muslims, should she go and right. how to deal with that and getting input from different people and so forth, the Temple on the Mount, I think it was. And, you know, she didn't want to endanger anybody, just trying to make decisions like that. It was hard, it was hard. Yeah. And never forgetting, don't forget what I said earlier about she was a treasure, maybe she has national aspirations right. and I don't want to interfere with that. I don't want to. And so if, if I can say one weakness I had, I was a little bit intimidated by the press. I was going to ask you about your, you know, that whole I was a little bit, dynamic. I was afraid. With, in all your roles. I was, I, retrospectively, I, I kept a distance. I would have Becky Taylor, who was a wonderful woman, uh, speak because I was very afraid of making Why? a mistake. I'm making a mistake of saying the wrong thing. Did anything, had something no, happened? No, 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 no. I just was afraid. So I didn't ingratiate myself with the press because I didn't give them anything on background. And I think to be, I, I actually think to be a good chief of staff or chief counsel, you have to feed the press. You have to keep 
the press, and if I had it to do over again, I would be very different. I definitely kept my distance from the press because I was afraid that I would make a mistake and tarnish my jewel, my jewel. Working hard, I could work hard for her, but what if I made a mistake? And they said, you know, Derman, you shouldn't have said that. So, so you feel that you, if you could do it again, you would work more closely yes. with the press? And I have given that advice to successor chiefs of staff, feed, feed the beast feed the beast appropriately, appropriately. There's always appropriate ways to do these things, really. But I had too much, I backed off and left it to Becky Taylor. We also had the whole thing with Wynne that was very exciting. Wynne, she wanted to um, build the tunnel to access the Mirage and, uh, you know, Donald mm -hmm. Trump thought she was, you know, building a tunnel to a competitor. He wasn't happy. We had to go through all of that. It was oh, wow. very, and it's like, wait, I'm talking to Steve Wynn. I'm like, you know, Harriet Derman uh, from Metuchen, New Jersey. And now I'm talking to Steve Wynn and he's not happy with me, you know, so. So just follow right. up on the press thing and the way yes. you would do something different. Do you feel it hurt you in any way that you didn't? Uh, or you just feel you would have had um, more uh, leverage in certain stories if you had Maybe more leverage and I think I, I I think it's always better to build bridges. So I'm not saying I burnt bridges, but I think it's always better to have a good rapport with people and um, build bridges and have good relationships. And I, in my life, I feel very blessed and enriched by the wonderful relationships and friends that I have and my husband has. And so I probably would have had more people in that category, but I really, really kept my distance. And that was a mistake. I wish I had somebody to give me better advice. And also, also another mistake I made. I guess you want to hear my mistakes too. If you want to talk about that. I was one. too involved in her campaign. In her campaign. She asked me to do that, to be the go-to person. But I was chief of staff. I should have had much more of a wall. Why was that a mistake? I think you have to keep, you know, um, there came a time when they said that I threatened, you know, Hispanics, we, we wouldn't give them money. I mean, it wasn't true. But if I hadn't been out there, it would, it would never have even been an opportunity for an allegation. So, but Governor Whitman asked me to assume that role. And again, I didn't say no. She trusted me. She needed somebody to be a liaison with her campaign. And she specifically turned to me to do that. And again, I didn't say no. And maybe I wasn't experienced enough to know. When you look at the Obama, you never see Chief of Staff Lou involved in his campaign. I should have really put up a wall. I mean, again, we didn't do anything inappropriate. We always met like a Republican headquarters, not, no campaign financing, no campaign activities in the office. But I wish I hadn't been involved at all. I should have just been responsible for state government. I shouldn't have had any responsibilities about her campaign. I shouldn't have gone to her debate practice. Do you know uh, what I mean? Anything like that. Do you that. think it would have been better for you, Harriet Derman's career, or better for the administration? Well, I don't think it hurt my career, but I just, I, I think that a chief of staff should not be involved in the, the politics of a reelection. Or there should be more of a barrier there. Right? Mm -hmm. I do. So if, you, you mentioned that this... But it was about trust. Governor Whitman wanted me. Like it. She wanted me to do yeah. that. Her uh, presidential aspirations, do you, were you very disappointed when, when that didn't come to pass? Well, again, I'd like to see a woman vice president, president, so I was disappointed, but we saw it coming. I mean, it was, you know, uh, the partial birth abortion turned out to really um, cause her problems with the far right. And... Um, I, somehow they associated her with the partial birth abortion. You don't hear about it anymore. No. You don't hear about it anymore. And then she went to the EPA, and I guess at the end she had some problems too. So I was disappointed. And, and then that terrible picture surfaced of her frisking uh, some young black men, I guess, in Camden. That, that didn't help either. So, you know, um, I, I wanted to see a woman. I would love to have Christy, seen Christy as the first um, Vice President, and I was disappointed when she bowed out of the Senate campaign too. We needed a female senator 
from New Jersey, but she, I guess, joined, I guess, I don't remember the timing, but I guess that's when she joined the EPA. What was your expectation that you would have gone with her if she had been? I was already a judge. Oh, right. I was already a judge, and I wasn't going to move to Washington. And I, the environment, my eyes always, Michael Torpy and I would always laugh about all those acronyms from the EPA, and our eyes would glaze over. The environment, I like the environment, I want to have a strong, but it, substantively, I, I didn't know that much about the environment. So, but it was... It was a wonderful opportunity to be chief of staff. I never in my life, did, when I went back to law school, did I ever think I would be chief of staff for a female governor who was a wonderful woman. You know, it was great. Wow. Thank you. Thank you.